My main hobby is model engineering, building and model gas and steam engines, all hand built in the machine, machine shop here in my basement. Um, that's my main hobby, model engineering, but uh, also get involved with uh, automotive restoration and other antiques. I collect little oiler oil cans, spark plugs, other antique items that interest me. Uh, I got started with model engineering when I was a young boy, probably 10 years old or something like that. I remember uh, seeing some engines on display and the entryway into the uh, state fair in Minot, North Dakota when we were on vacation one time. After that, when I was about 14 years old, I seen some advertisement in the Poplar Mechanics magazine for some steam engines and I sent away for the plans and uh, built one from those plans and then uh, it kind of evolved into building more steam engines and I ordered some casting kits, machine from there, built up a shop and some tools and uh, that got me going and still going at it. Model engineering is the building of either vintage or modern mechanical devices, steam engines, gas engines, shop equipment. It can be a lathe or a milling machine. Uh, they can be automotive engines, railroad, but all those things operating and in miniature. Well, model engineering, of course, like I say, is a lot of machine work and uh, it's rewarding to take a piece of iron and like one fellow used to say, just take a piece of iron and cut off everything that doesn't look like an engine. Well, you're working to kind of more precision than that, but to create a, a usable part out of a piece of bar stock or uh, modify a piece so that it works, you know, it, it's rewarding. It uh, gives you some accomplishment. We make every part pretty much. I don't make my rivets and screws kind of thing, but every other part is handmade in a gas engine. We sometimes wind our own valve springs, uh, make your own valve keepers, valves, piston rings, bearings, flywheels. Every, every part is machined. I had a big project of a locomotive, uh, numbered 8717. I started it in 1987 and finished it in 2017, hence the number 8717. So. I guess my, my biggest project has been the locomotive, uh, which is a 484 Northern, three quarter inch scale, three quarter inches equals a foot. It'll haul two or three adults along behind it. It should, I've never had it on the track and run it, to be honest with you. I've run it in here, but I've never run it uh, on a track yet. I don't know if I ever will or not, I don't know. But the only castings you see here are the frames for the back here, just the wheels and the cylinders. The rest is all fabricated from bar stock. All of these side rods, are all made from just ordinary steel that you'll buy at the steel supply. And uh, worked, worked in the milling machine to remove all the unnecessary parts and machine them to, to precision. Checker plate along the side here to look like a, a walkway. The boiler is uh, copper inside of a boiler jacket here. It runs on 80 pounds of steam. Propane fired up underneath here, there's a, there's a propane burner. In the building of the tender, I quit counting at 1,024 rivets. Uh, all 364 of an inch in diameter. Um, in the cab here you can see some of the controls. Uh, this lever right here is for forward and reverse. This one is the throttle. This lever here. Um, this one is for the left, the right hand injector. Uh, this one's left injector. This one's the whistle. The two valves here are for the steam glass. You, you can see your water level inside the boiler in that glass. And of course, there's a pressure gauge on the far side. I kind of chose to do a train because, you know, what kid doesn't like a train? You know, you had an electric train when I was young. You know, trains are always intriguing. And, uh, you know, steam was on top of my list too. I, I was model engineering at one point. And so, steam train was it. Well, I got interested in machining. My dad was a machinist in the Second World War. He passed away when I was very young, though at 12 years old, but I still remember him working at the lathe, and I used to have his lathe here in the shop. I was interested in mechanical things, and we always did our own work on the farm. My dad always overhauled his own tractors and you know, built farm equipment. I had a mentor here in town, uh, Bill Winteringham was his name, who uh, helped me get started in it too, helped me along with certain projects if I get stuck on a little job or something. 
But now, since uh, since then, uh, the community has grown. We have uh, three or four others here in Esteban that are uh, working in model engineering. As well, at the show, we get many variations of people with all different aspects of the hobby and from all different areas. Like We have like seven American states, I think, and provinces from BC all the way to Ontario come to the show. Actually, a few years ago, we were on vacation and we stopped to see a fella in Iowa one of the model engineers, and he says, you want to come along to the model engineer meeting tomorrow? I said, I didn't know anything about it. So we went to this show, a little meeting they had, once a month they do it, all the friends get together, and uh, you know, bring a little show and tell and have a little meeting. I thought, well, hey, that's a good idea. So we started that here in Esteban, did last winter we meet once a month at different shops and see what the other guys are doing, and that gets a few more people interested, and some guys have need some material or that kind of thing, you know, we can always, uh, um, help each other out kind of thing. So a couple years ago I was invited to go along down to Rolog, Minnesota. They had gone through many hoops to get uh, Kerosene Annie uh, into out of a private collection in Idaho to bring it out to Minnesota to have it at their Rumley Expo. Now Kerosene Annie was a prototype in 1909 for the Rumley tractor to burn kerosene and it was an experimental tractor me and the fellow from Phil, Clyde Hall from Fillmore were invited to come down and get it running. We were the first two to get it running after probably 40, 50 years of it sitting idle. And we got it running. Within a couple of days we had it running and had it on, on uh, display at uh, Western Minnesota Steam Thrashers Reunion. And um, we plowed with it, um, cut wood, uh, thrashed, and we had it on the prony break. So in 2012, a bunch of the guys at the Esteban Model Engineering Show got together and said, why don't we make something for Kelly for appreciation for the work of putting the show on every year. So they all got together without me knowing anything about it. And Benjamin Roth and Frosty from town here got together and they said, let's contact who wants to participate. So on the plaque here, each person made a part and they're all noted here what part they made and everything. At 2013 at the show, they presented me with this with this uh, engine, and uh, I've, I've had it along for a long time. I run it on a little can of, of air. I had it on my desk at work for for a few years too, where people come in and see that, and I'd run it for them on, the on my desk at work. But first off, I have a hard time making two parts that fit together in my own shop, let alone them come from all over, from different people. And he said only had one part that he had to tweak a little bit to make it fit. My model engineering interest is in the older stuff because I, I'm more the antique world or whatever. I'm involved with antique tractors as well. I'm involved with the Crosby Thrashing Bee. I grew up on a farm, but I always had interest in old equipment. So that drew me towards older type stuff. And it's usually, it's more, it's, it can be simpler. It can be uh, done more with uh, manual machines rather than uh, computer operated machines. The new world is coming in too quite a bit. You see, I have a 3D printer sitting here too. This is a insulator for a magneto to give you spark to run a gas engine. And I had a glass one, they're a porcelain thing. I had to get my daughter to draw it on CAD. And then she brought it home, we put it in a 3D printer, and you remove all these support structures afterwards, which is uh, which actually got to be the start of the, the oil can collecting from this insulator. Because I made these insulators, and I gave them to the guy who was doing the magnetos. And he gave me about six or eight oil cans. He says, I really don't want these around anymore. He says, I'll trade you for the, some of your work that you did. Sure. I said, no, Lake, I, I kind of got interested in oil cans. Didn't realize there were so many different ones. But he traded me the work for making the insulator for a few oil cans, which led into, I think there's 225 oil cans out in the display. Oilers, we call them. Oil, small miniature oil cans, like the little household oil cans. My kids told me I'm a nerd if I got my oil cans and spark plugs on an Excel spreadsheet, but when you're at a show and you buy a can, you don't want to get a duplicate, so you have them all listed out. But, so I have a collection of uh, oil cans, which I always add to every swap meet or flea market I go to. I bought some in Pennsylvania last winter, which were actually from the First World War. They were glass bottles, and it says on the front, temporary container for the metal to be used for the war effort. So they were pretty rare find to find these glass uh, Plus oil bottles. But yeah, there's many different brands of that. I've got a nice cupboard out there to kind of display it in a little bit. 
And that goes, and every once in a while while I'm looking for oil cans, I'll find spark plugs to go with my spark plug collection. Spark plugs have intrigued me, the different variations they had in them. Different shapes, different colors, mostly the electrodes on the bottom, the part inside the engine. I have one with a fan on the bottom called a fan flame. I have a lighthouse spark plug because it looks like a lighthouse on top. I've got some with uh, primer cups on the side to prime the engine with gasoline. I've got brass ones, which were earlier, the earliest spark plugs. And then I have some nickel plated ones, which came in a little later. Those would have been in big fancy cars like Packard and Oldsmobiles and stuff like that. Bigger, bigger cars back in the, in the teens. Then they evolve into just a steel spark plug, but there are many different variations of those too. The thrill is in the finding them. Like I can go on the internet and buy all I wanted on there if I wanted, but that's no fun. More fun to see them at a show or at a swap meet or in an antique shop somewhere. With the model engine building, uh, would always take me to different shows. Uh, main one for me is the Crosby Thrashing Bee. I got me go, got going down there with my model engines along with uh, Bill Windringham from town here. Would go there and I went with Windringham on the tractor in the parade, the big tractor, because he said I could use a little help. That got me involved with there, which got me in a friendship with John Tissy from Crosby, which then I restored my dad's uh, 51 GMC pickup, which has been in the family since new. And then I picked up a Model T from uh, Crosby, uh, which my friend John says if I wanted one to pick out that second one from the end, he said. And I said, why that one? Because it was in a row of junkers that all looked the same. And he says, the guy had bought it new in Crosby and he was too thrifty to buy gas, he said, so he uh, wouldn't, it wouldn't be wore out, and it wasn't. So then that led into restoring a Model T uh, Roadster pickup, 1925, and then I had a bunch of leftover parts from that, which evolved into building a jalopy or a hillbilly wagon or a jitney, whatever you want to call them. Well, of course, it starts with a carcass. Pretty much it. Um, one fellow says they barely make a shadow when you get started, but start with a carcass and just a few pieces at a time, find parts at swap meets, flea markets. There's a lot of reproduction parts available too. But to start on that and, and rebuild uh, a rusty piece of junk back into something that's operating again. So to keep the history alive, the, one, the Model T that I restored will be 100 years old from 1925 to 2025, it's 24 this year, so 99 years old. Uh, but you can drive around town and people are waving and honking at you. And it's a different, different uh, way of driving around, that's for sure. You know, Model T has got extra pedals on the floor for your feet. It's not a clutch like you would think and push on the pedal to go instead of push on the pedal to stop. It, it's different, but it, it gets to be second nature as you're driving. People look at you kind of strange when you signal with your arms. This is a 1925 Model T Ford Roadster pickup. Uh, been completely restored. Uh, engine, drivetrain, er, and upholstery and top are all uh, been refurbished. Uh, all kinds of bodywork. The wheels have been uh, I scraped them with glass to remove any old varnish and paint. And revarnished those. A few years of uh, work to get it restored to this condition. But it's enjoyable, I drive it every day I can. Take it for coffee in the mornings. I've done on a couple of, well, a half hour drive to a normal vehicle, but they're an hour with this. And then the leftovers from this one became this thing, which is parts anywhere from 1919 all the way up to 1928. Now they quit making Model T's in 1927, but the engine is 1928 and it came out of a Gleaner combine. Uh, they used the Model T engine and the Gleaner combine in 1928, and the last Model T engine was built in 1940, they tell me. But this was all the leftover parts, all, the, all mixed up different years, things don't fit properly. Uh, it was just put together as a fun project. There's, there's shotgun and traps and a whiskey still in the back, and they got my pet skunk hanging here on the mirror. Just all kinds of things people can ask questions about when you get to the car shows and stuff, and they get a real kick out of it. You let the kids sit in there, honk the horn, play in there a little bit, they ain't gonna hurt nothing. You can see the sign over there says touch, but please don't look. <laughs> There's all, you can always learn. No matter how old you are, you can always learn something. Even whether it be from an old car, learn some history, learn the way they used to make something in the machining world, learn a new way. 
of making something in the machining world, like I say, with computer machinery now and whatnot. Collecting, it's always fun to find something on a holiday. Go on a holiday and find a few little trinkets here or there of, of, to add to your collection. I don't know. The collecting thing is how, how, you, how you explain it. I have to, maybe they, one guy told me one time, I have to explain it, you won't understand. <laughs> Well, really the favorite part of it all is having all the people come together for the model engine show in the fall. You, know, you get uh, 40, 50 people together all with the same hobby, which is a very odd hobby. You don't run into too many people that do it. To get them all together in the same room, all with the same mindset, the same ideas, and all of the work that they've done, some beautiful stuff that's almost museum quality, right down to people who have just started and are looking for ideas. And there's, But it's very rewarding to build some pieces Put them all together, set it on the bench, put some gas in it, hook up some spark, electricity for spark, and when it fires the first time, just like uh, birth of a new child almost, you know. It is very rewarding to see that run, something you created. If people are interested in model engineering and uh, are building some model engines, I really recommend that you come to the Esteban Model Engineering Show Saturday after Canadian Thanksgiving in the Wiley Mitchell Building on the Esteban Fairgrounds. Or you can find us on Facebook. You can contact me through there. Esteban Model Engineering Show has its own page. We also have a website, estebanmodelengineeringshow.net. The information about the show is on there. Or if you run into me, talk to me. Once you find one person, then you find two, then you find three, and it all kind of grows from there.